Hey, welcome to Scooby-Tobia. I'm in the mood for something absolutely diabolical. My little series of Scooby-Doo's scariest villains tends to lean heavily toward villains in episodes from the Scooby-Doo show, so I think we can all agree that it just might be the scariest classic Scooby series. One episode that always stands out for many reasons enough to be highly requested comes from the third season, airing November 18th, 1978, and it's definitely a very groovy 70s episode. Today's villain is simply referred to as The Phantom, and he comes from the diabolical disc demon, haunting a recording studio. Definitely a popular episode, this one's been on home video a decent amount, first landing on this Footlight Follies VHS in 1991. In 2015, it was even a bonus episode on the Blu-ray for Scooby's crossover movie with the band Kiss. For obvious reasons, the Phantom clearly got inspired. There's plenty to discuss here, so let's waste no time. The episode opens with the exterior of Decade Records, but for such a prestigious studio, you'd think they'd have a better logo outside. This looks like they told a janitor to just go outside and paint the name on the building. We hear someone screaming, Tony Signs, inside, and we immediately see what makes this episode so memorable. You know too much Tony Signs, and you will not get away from me. Not only is the Phantom way more detailed than most Scooby villains in his nightmarish Bowie Kiss Fever Dream design, there's way more animation going on with him, way more frames than you pretty much ever see on a Scooby-Doo or even Hannah Barbera character in general. It makes him so much more otherworldly and disconcerting that he moves so fluidly. Even as he chases Tony out, as we see Tony here running to check the doors and look back, he has so much more detail on him as well. Opening the door, the angle here is so much more interesting than cinematography we usually see and really adds to the tone. Somehow, Tony manages to write what appears to be an entire song in a matter of seconds he has before the Phantom enters. The shot of him entering, speaking of, again, the animation, and then Tony's reaction? Well, uh, it's, it's fluid, but the uh, pose is is, uh, it's hilarious. That's a backbreaker. <laughs> with the gang, they're listening to their friend Jimmy Lewis's song on the radio, on the way to the studio to visit. Even here, if less fluid, there's a lot of noticeable movement more than we're used to seeing. No bell. No bell? Try knocking, Scoob. Okay. Scooby! Jimmy sees the gang and gets them in past the suspicious-looking guard, admitting it's not a good time since songwriter Tony Signs, who we saw prior, is missing, leaving only that song he wrote out so quickly. Jimmy admits it's not really good, but will still sell with Tony's name, and Daphne adds with Jimmy's voice as well. Jimmy gives the music to Ian Barkin, pianist and arranger, who also notices the handwriting is unusually shaky on top of the quality itself. Next we meet Ace Decade, nephew of THE Mr. Decade, and engineer Brick Tyler. Scooby meanwhile almost destroys some expensive equipment. Maybe don't let a dog inside a recording studio. Ian starts playing the music, and it definitely sounds pretty ass, when suddenly everything starts exploding, Ace attributing it to the Phantom. The boys on their way out get a spook from the guard, and Jimmy explains the ghost is supposedly a musician seeking vengeance against those who ruined his career. What musician? What career? Uh, guess we'll never know. Left alone while the others go get more equipment, the boys screw around, Scooby over it, until hearing a noise that turns out to be the Phantom, so they get the hell out of there. But he does gleefully get his hands on what he seemed to be looking for. Elsewhere, Jimmy shows off the shipping room with all his records ready to be sent out. However, mathematician Velma notices there are stacks missing, courtesy of the Phantom, as the boys arrive to tell their tale. Oh my god, please, why is Scooby imitating the Phantom here so nightmarish? I almost wanted to make that the thumbnail, but I don't want to scare people away. Realizing the music was taken, Jimmy offers to get his spare copy, but the boys offer to do it just to get out of here longer, while Brick suspiciously leaves to get more equipment. In the dressing room, the Phantom is already waiting. I guess he's too blind under the mask to find the music himself, or too lazy, whichever, as he tells them to hand it over. Here, hold this a minute, will you, Scoob? I don't have any music. Then I'll get it from the mutt. <laughs> what? Are you gonna take that from him, Scoob? They get him to just run circles around them enough to cheekily play cards. He's really not the brightest villain, but yeesh, this zoom in, enough. The boys get into a proper chase, but to their credit, they do keep the music safe in hand all the way back to the others. Thelma puts together that whatever's up with that song and why he wants it is related to what's been occurring. With a spook from the loudspeaker by the Phantom, the boys get a jump scare from Ace as the Phantom continues to shout out threats. Ace recognizing it's from the intercoms, they split up to check them all, except the boys who want some food. The others realize it's just a recording with the on switch taped in place, meaning the Phantom could still be anyone here, especially Ace, since it's in his office. In the cafeteria, anyone wants some pop? Popsy Pop? Actually, I love this scene. Shaggy tries to get a milkshake from the machine, tries to see why it won't work, and Scooby eats it while he's distracted. Then Shaggy's hungry enough to try it again, repeat, and repeat. But Scooby's hungry ass turns some peck around for one more shake, though he does get a little karma. We start all over again though when Shaggy pays for another snack and it just shoots out to Scooby while he's none the wiser. Twice, again. And they hear a noise in a locked room and hear a scream, locking the door in fear of the Phantom as banging starts from the other side. They go to tell the others they caught him, but the guard tosses 
them out on the street, while inside it seems they can't replace the equipment until tomorrow after all. Shaggy tries to toss Scooby into the window, but he goes too high, bounces around, and plops. So Scooby tries lifting next when the trash can he's on falls, revealing those missing records of Jimmy's. Daphne, with some surprising new talent, tries to play Tony's song, but it's just no good, so Velma wonders if it's a message. Suddenly, it seems the Phantom might be in the vent in a moment of suspense that turns out to be the boys telling them about the albums they found while the Phantom creeps in. He gets the music and gloats, but the unusually capable Scooby lassos it back, and they just goofily play catch the music as it flies through the air here, so chaotic, like, okay. Somehow, Scooby even takes a ride on it and conveniently drops right where the Phantom will get caught in all the reels. Unmasked, the Phantom is Ace Decade, stealing the records from his uncle for personal profit. The intercom thing was to make him seem like he was being framed, and the music was his goal because it reveals he's the Phantom. Spell out the notes on the first three bars and you get his name. That's why the song sounds like dog shit. Oddly, whenever the song was played in the episode by Ian or Daphne initially, we never once hear the music motif played. Not to mention that Daphne played it in G major while Ian played it in C major. Maybe her talent isn't so spot on. It's also not very likely Ace would figure out the clue was about him just by listening to it be played, but that's the explanation they go with and the only thing that lines up with the sabotaging of equipment. Still wondering what happened to Tony. It clicks for Shaggy and he goes back to the locked door from earlier. Sure enough, it's Tony who screamed prior because he thought they were the Phantom right back. And maybe Scooby is scary enough to be the Phantom. I buy it. As the episode ends, he gets a little bit more of that good old karma. I've seen people discuss this episode and call it, as the kids say, mid, or that it's a below average episode with not enough mystery or intrigue and too much comedy and nothing interesting happens. And maybe so. Maybe that could be true. For you. But any grown adult man I've spoken to continues to be haunted by this diabolical disc demon. And if anything matters to qualify as a scariest villain, I would say that's what matters. Even if the rest of the episode isn't the most amazing episode of Scooby-Doo known to man, the opening scene alone and the intense design of this phantom make it one hard to forget for more people than not, I find. Say what you want about it not being creepy? That thing skulking around is terrifying. It's definitely one of the most memorable for me, and a most enjoyable one whenever I rewatch it. Even the humor just really hits for me. Sometimes it's okay for Scooby-Doo to be funny, even in a Scariest Villains episode. Does Ace count as a Nepo Baby villain? He's for sure kind of lame for someone that has such a great costume, but that explains why he's one of the more stupid villains. He's probably never had to do much himself before. Special shout out to Jimmy, he is indeed very cute and I would buy his records. And we've come so far back around that all these vinyl records aren't outdated anymore like a few years ago. This is just a normal day in music again. What about you? Does the Phantom, the diabolical disc demon himself, count for one of your scariest villains? If so, what memories do you have of him, new or old? Or is he actually just really chill and boring for you? Let's hear it in the comments. If you like the video, do the like and subscribe thing. Follow on social media, I guess, like Tumblr or whatever, but not Instagram because they deleted my Instagram for not being a real enough person because I only talked about my YouTube channel. I'm like, whatever. Thank you, Mark Zuckerberg. I'll see you next time in Scooby-Tobia. Bye!